You have with you, I hope, A.J. Ayer's Language, Truth and Logic. And would you therefore turn to the first chapter, which uh, begins on page 33. Uh, we should perhaps observe that the introduction was, um, let's see, the introduction to the first edition was in 1935. And the introduction to this edition, the much longer initial introduction that runs up to page 26, was uh, 10 years later in 46. And in that 10 years, Ayer had been exposed to all sorts of criticism, including the beginnings of the ordinary language tradition that um, we've referred to and we're looking at more in detail. And so um, this edition then, um, while the, uh, the text itself is from 35, comes to us with certain changes introduced in the introduction, which softens somewhat the hard-nosed scientific positivism that comes through in the body of the text. But um, it's the body of the text, the first edition, that historically has been so tremendously influential and which popularized the logical positivist or logical empiricist, as it's sometimes called, um, movement in the middle decades of this century. Uh, chapter one on the elimination of metaphysics sets the stage. And it's plain that that has to come first in as much as uh, pretty well every other topic taken up in subsequent chapters hinges on that elimination of metaphysics. After all, without metaphysics, the function of philosophy is changed. The nature of philosophical analysis is not going to be such that it's telling us about a reality beyond experience. The a priori does not tell us about reality, it's simply tautological. And uh, truth and probability can be taken in a phenomenalist rather than a realist sense. And um, ethics does not tell us about objective moral order in reality, nor does theology tell us about the metaphysical entity uh, known as God. So that the elimination of metaphysics is, if you like, not only the title of the first chapter, uh, but it's the underlying thesis that runs through the entirety of the book. Now, um, you may say to yourself, um, well, curious that he eliminated metaphysics because we have been having a course on contemporary metaphysics. Here we are just a few days, decades later on, and metaphysics seems to be alive and well. What's happened? Well, uh, two things. One, we commented on last time the critique of the verifiability criterion of meaning on the basis of which metaphysics was declared meaningless. And with that criterion disposed of, people can now do metaphysics again in good philosophical conscience. But the second reason is that people began to rethink uh, what do we mean by metaphysics? What is the essential nature of metaphysics? And you can uh, see the point if you look on page 33, uh, the first sentence of the second paragraph, uh, the understanding of metaphysics that he has. 
He says we may begin by criticizing the metaphysical thesis that philosophy affords us knowledge of a reality transcending the world of common sense and science, the world of science and common sense. Now, you've um, been reading Whitehead, who is 20th century metaphysician par excellence. And he is not interested in realities transcending the world of science and common sense. Whitehead is concerned as to whether the entities that science theorizes about and that ordinary experience or common sense encounters, whether these are properly understood. Uh, for Whitehead, metaphysics is not about some transcendent reality, but is about the reality encountered in science and common sense. And he just wants to make sure uh, that um, we have the best science possible and don't engage in mistaken concreteness, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So, um, in effect, Whitehead's view is that metaphysics is a speculative system that grows out of and incorporates proper scientific concepts and concrete experience. It's a speculative system that intends to engage in extrapolation, generalization from what we know to encompass the whole. And so he develops his conceptualization of an event based on both ordinary experience and science and then generalizes that everything that exists is of the nature of an event, so described, God included. So a different conception of metaphysics. And uh, one, I think Whitehead would say, which runs back all the way through modern history and back even into the Greeks. But that's not the only conception of metaphysics which developed. Um, there was, uh, in addition to that, uh, a conception of metaphysics adapted from the medieval way of analogy. The medievals, you remember, with their hierarchy of being, talked of analogical predication. There are degrees of being and of various properties. And uh, there was, in the uh, 1940s, a book published by Dorothy Emmett, quite influential. A book by Dorothy Emmett called The Nature of Metaphysical Thinking which suggested that metaphysics is an attempt to uh, work with a coordinating analogy, a coordinating analogy drawn from ordinary experience. Um, similarly, there was a book by Stephen Pepper called uh, world Hypotheses, also published in the early 1940s, in which he talked of root metaphors which are developed into metaphysical schemes, conceptual schemes. So that what you have here is the notion of an all-embracing conceptual scheme as metaphysics an all-abracing scheme which is able to unify everything by virtue of some coordinating analogy or some metaphor which runs through the whole field. So that uh, Pepper would say, for instance, and uh, Pepper would say that the conception of an organismic model is a root metaphor. Emmett would say it's a coordinating analogy. A mechanistic metaphysic has the mechanistic root metaphor, coordinating analogy. 
you'll see. The form and matter uh, duality in Greek metaphysics, drawn, if you like, from a work of art, the form and the matter, provides another root metaphor, coordinating analogy. So what you have then is a conceptual scheme uh, based on some uh, such uh, conceptual aid, spinning off from the notion of analogical thinking that was developed in other ways in the Middle Ages. Um, there is a third conception of metaphysics which grew out of the ordinary language movement that we'll be um, exploring as uh, conceptual map work. And uh, that's represented by Ian Ramsey, who taught at Oxford uh, the notion of conceptual map work. He has a book called Prospect for Metaphysics published also in the 1940s, Prospect for Metaphysics. Con uh, conceptual map work, that, that is to say, uh, charting the ways in which in ordinary language we do talk of the whole of reality in certain, um, um, uh, pays attention to the use of the word I, the use of the word I as um, a unifying point in uh, talking about one's um, experience and uh, suggests that in similar fashion the word God uh, functions as a unifier of discourse, a unifier of conceptualization in any theistic scheme. So um, the emphasis, uh, I think it's fair to say, in all three of these approaches is on conceptual schemes, conceptual schemes, rather than on a deductive system of a foundationalist sort, like Descartes and Spinoza attempted, you'll see. Uh, you'll find that Ayer repudiates that sort of deductive system building <coughs> in metaphysics, and he repudiates uh, the notion of a reality that transcends the appearances with which science and common sense deal, as in the Hegelian tradition, reality and appearance. Uh, so the more modest notion of a conceptual scheme. Now, I referred you to page 33, and notice that at the very bottom of that page, he rejects the idea that we are endowed with a faculty of intellectual intuition, uh, which would enable us to identify some Descartes-type first axioms. He repudiates that. And on page 35, he um, states the criterion of verifiability in the middle of the page. A sentence is factually significant to a given person if and only if he knows how to verify the proposition it purports to express. That is, if he knows what observations would lead him to accept the proposition as being true or reject it as being false. The question isn't whether it's true or false, but whether it is capable of being verified or falsified. Does it have cognitive meaning? Is it factually significant? Does it refer to anything? That's the criteria. And if you look at page um, 38, uh, you notice he talks about um, a weaker sense of verification, 
The question must be asked about any putative statement of fact. Is not, would any observations make its truth or falsehood certain? But, now that's what we called weak verification rather than strong verification. Okay? Is it at all amenable to any kind of support from empirical data? Um, the uh, whipping boys that he has in mind appear on page 34 where at the beginning of the middle paragraph he uh, refers to Kant who condemned transcendent metaphysics on different grounds and at the bottom of the page he refers to Bradley who you remember had a metaphysic in his major work called Appearance and Reality the very title of which is what is anathema to Ayer. Okay. Well, uh, any, any comment there? That uh, first chapter, I think, comes very clearly into focus. I might say that some positivists went even uh, one step beyond Ayer uh, into asking why it is if uh, metaphysical statements are factually meaningless uh, that some people have persisted in making metaphysical statements. And there are two writers of particular interest in that regard. One is an American, Morris Lazarowitz, who taught at Smith College and in a book of his called The Structure of Metaphysics tried to, to say uh, that this is the product of some um, um, psychopathology. Uh, that is to say the subconscious is uh, projecting worlds which emotionally it, it cannot live without. And there is um, uh, one uh, individual, J. O. Wisdom, incidentally not the John Wisdom of importance later in ordinary language stuff, but his brother. Uh, J. O. Wisdom, who um, wrote a book called, um, now the title slips me, The Psychoanalysis of George Berkeley's philosophy, in which he, I was going to say argued, I think asserted would be the better, um, that um, as a result of his own posthumous analysis of Berkeley, um, he had a pathological aversion to dirt and excretion, and for that reason had to deny the independent reality of any such thing. Um, uh, this, this seems to me to be uh, a rather uh, pathetic kind of um, scientific attempt to explain metaphysics because however would that be amenable uh, to um, verification or falsification? You see, it's a sort of self-refuting thing for a positivist to do. But um, uh, curious and interesting. Any comment, question? Chapter 1. Okay, chapter two, the function of philosophy. The function of philosophy. And uh, at the very beginning, you begin to see where he's heading. He starts among the superstitions. Uh, notice he cannot avoid the ad hominems. It's not very scientific. The word superstition is an emotionally loaded thing. Among the superstitions from which we are freed by the abandonment of metaphysics is the view that the business of the philosopher is to construct a deductive system. In rejecting this, we're not suggesting philosophers can dispense with deductive reasoning, but contesting the right to posit first principles. 
and then offered them and their consequences as a complete picture of reality. So there's the farewell to Descartes, Spinoza and company. Um, instead, on 47, right across from there, um, the last paragraph begins, um, now let's see, big pardon, on 48 is what I want, uh, 48. Yes, the little paragraph in the middle of 48, with the overthrow of speculative philosophy, we're in a position to see that the function of philosophy is wholly critical. In what exactly does its critical activity consist? Um, in the early part of the century, I think I mentioned this before, the tendency was to say that philosophy had two functions, the speculative and critical. The speculative function being the development of metaphysical systems, and the critical function being the criticism of arguments and increasingly the analysis of concepts and uh, the odd things that philosophers say. So the development of analytic philosophy in Russell, and Moore and company was simply stressing and further developing the tools for critical functions of philosophy. It's the speculative function of metaphysics that is now being discarded by the logical positivists, leaving only the critical function. And um, he maintains that um, this function is one of the age-old functions. Uh, certainly, Socrates' dialogues engage in a great deal of analysis and criticism. Uh, similarly, too, with people like uh, Descartes, at least in Meditation One, and David Hume, and Immanuel Kant. After all, he labeled his a critical philosophy, and so forth. So he picks up several examples, and on page 49, it's the problem of induction. The problem of induction which has, of course, um, been rooted uh, historically in there being uh, some metaphysical stability, some metaphysical order, the Aristotelian kind of metaphysical order initially. But in the empiricists from Hume onwards was problematic because you couldn't know about such metaphysical order and reality. Well, um, at the very top of page 50, Ayer calls it a fictitious problem. Because if the quest for metaphysical understanding is a pseudo-function of philosophy, uh, then um, the problem of not being able to gain such is a fictitious problem. It's not really a logical problem for philosophers at all. Uh, we can continue to engage in inductive reasoning for the simple reason that it seems to work for scientific purposes. What more do we want? There's a dose here of pragmatic justification for the purposes of science and common sense. We don't need the purposes of metaphysical systems with logical certainty. That's irrelevant. Um, so he, he makes that uh, knowledge of reality is simply not the concern of science. It's not the concern of science. And so on page 57, the paragraph in the middle of the page sums up what he takes to be the function. The propositions of philosophy, he says, are not factual, this is 57, the center paragraph. The propositions of philosophy are not factual but linguistic in character. That is, they don't describe the behavior of physical or mental objects, but they express definitions 
and the logical consequences of definitions. So we may say that philosophy, with its propositions, is a department of logic. The characteristic mark of a purely logical inquiry is its concern with the formal consequences of definitions, not with empirical fact. So he's going to tell us that there are no factual philosophical propositions. There are no factual philosophical propositions. Remember his delineation, two kinds of cognitive, cognitively meaningful propositions. Analytic and synthetic. The synthetic are the factual. The analytic are the formal. Okay. Um, the um, asserting and justifying, formulating of factual propositions is the big business of the empirical sciences. So that philosophy's propositions have to be analytic, formal ones. We're dealing, that is to say, with definitions and the logical consequences of those definitions. <coughs> philosophy, then, has only one function, the analytic function. The analytic function. <coughs> So then, the, the question becomes, uh, what is the nature of philosophical analysis? And that is the topic of, quest of chapter 3. Chapter 3. Now, uh, here look, if you would, at um, page 60. Page 60. At the bottom of the page, the end of the complete paragraph, for the philosopher, as we've already said, is primarily concerned with the provision not of explicit definitions, dictionaries do that, but of definitions in use, definitions in use. We define a symbol in use not by saying that it is synonymous with some other symbol. Definitions give you all sorts of synonyms. But by showing how the sentences in which it significantly occurs, that is meaningfully used, okay, can be translated into equivalent sentences, the logically equivalent which contain neither the definiendum, the thing which is to be defined, nor any of the synonyms into which it would be defined. Now, a good illustration of this process is provided by Bertrand Russell's theory of definite descriptions. And I mentioned this without labeling it that way when we were talking about Russell. I used his example the present king of France is bald. Or, I think I use this one as well, the, authorly, the author of Waverley is Scott, Sir Walter Scott. Here I notice Ayer does not say the author of Waverley was Scott, but was Scotch, Scottish. Uh, well, Sir Walter Scott was Scottish. But his point is that the sentence, a sentence like that, the author of Waverley was Scotch, is equivalent to the following. And here's Russell's the theory of definite descriptions. That is to say, just how do you analyze a statement like the author of Waverley was Scotch? You want to analyze it into its logical constituents. One person and one person only wrote Waverley. 
and that person was Scotch. Now, you, you see, by opening up the logical meaning of the sentence, you now have statements that are more readily accessible to empirical verification or falsification. That's Ayer's point. By this exercise of logical analysis, uh, what you are doing is asking yourself, is this statement a factually, a factually meaningful statement, or is it not? You see. And uh, if it is, then you can refer it to um, whoever's appropriate business it is to determine its factuality, presumably to the literary critic. It's not the business of the philosopher to ascertain truth, but only by careful logical analysis to determine who can ascertain truth. To ask, is it meaningful, empirically meaningful? Well, look again on page 64, and um, a further example that he gives at the bottom of that page, the new paragraph, he talks of the problem of giving an actual rule for translating sentences. Here's this business of logical analysis by finding a logical equiv logically equivalent sentence, which is more amenable to empirical verification. The problem of translating sentences about a material body into sentences about sense data. Ah, sense contents. Which may be called the problem of the reduction of material things to sense contents. Now, this is the main philosophical part of the traditional problem of perception. Now, think about that for a moment. The problem of perception which is raised by Plato in the Republic and the Theaetetus about the reliability of sense perception in telling us about the real nature of physical things. The problem of perception as posed by Locke's representational theory and the correspondence between um, primary and secondary quality sensations on the one hand, material object on the other. Are primary qualities qualities of an object, as Locke thought, or are they purely subjective, as Berkeley thought? Okay, now that's the kind of thing. And in the realist idealist debate of the 1910s and the 1920s, remember when we were talking about G.E. Moore, G. E. Moore was unclear about the relationship between sense data that we're directly aware of and the material object. Are the sense data the qualities of surface patches on a material object? Or are the sense qualities rather simply uh, subjective ideas which we ascribe to a material object? And it seems that the whole realist idealist debate, the realist phenomenalist debate of those days, hinged on the theory of sense data. And we'll be coming back to that um, later on. But he is saying that um, really the only philosophical significance to the thing is um, uh, the question of whether logic, whether sense datum statements are the logical equivalent of material object statements? Or is the sum left over in a material object statement that is not reducible to sense datum statements? You see? Well, there's, there's one notion um, involved in a material object statement of 
uh, what you can call spatial occupancy. This space is taken. You see, spatial occupancy. Well, is that contained within sense datum statements about color and size and shape or not? And so you, you find that um, uh, one of the debates which grows out of the positivist approach is whether the reduction of material objects, physical objects, to sense datum statements can ever be complete. Okay. Now, there are some of the early positivists, like Schlick, Moritz Schlick, who said, yes, it can be. And so um, he's inclined to be a physicalist in the sense that our knowledge of sense data is a knowledge of physical objects. But on the other hand, um, Ayer is not so sure. He's not so sure. Um, there seems to be some untranslatable ingredient in the language about material objects. Uh, so he comes out more as a phenomenalist. You'll see. Um, he does make reference at one point to the um, need to have ostensive statements. Ostensive statements are ones, empirical sense datum statements, they are ones which um, are so self-evident as to be absolutely certain. And he denies that there can be any such. Whereas some of the other logical positivists believe that there were ostensive statements, sense datum statements that are absolutely certain. After all, uh, you might suppose um, that um, um, a sense datum statement about a color you observe is absolutely certain. But is it? Once you consider all the observation conditions that go into observing a color. Observation conditions about the light in which you're seeing things and so on and so forth. He does um, later on come down to the view, and he mentions this in that long introduction, uh, that there are certain uh, basic statements that we can appeal to that are much more sure than many others. Basic statements. Uh, but still, not the absolute certainty of the ostensive statements. Now, this business of um, analyzing material object statements into sense datum statements uh, illustrates what becomes um, for uh, many philosophical concerns a much larger issue. Because as the mind-body question came under discussion using these tools, the question was what was whether mental state statements are translatable without remainder into brain state statements. That is to say, whether you can adopt a physicalist interpretation of mind. Now, uh, this um, after the taboo about metaphysics is lifted becomes very significant. Because the attempt of the eliminative materialist, the materialist who wants to eliminate mind, is not only to eliminate a metaphysical entity called mind, but also to eliminate any language about mind. Because mental state language, he thinks, can be translatable without remainder into physical state language, including brain states. Whereas others will say there's one dimension that is lost in that. Mental state language is an I language rather than an it language. And the self-referentiality of the I language of mental states is what is lost. Incidentally, if you've read any of the um, writings of Donald Mackay, um, M-C-K-A-Y, 
the uh, English brain scientist and philosopher, uh, also an evangelical. Um, his books have been um, published by InterVarsity Press and circulated quite widely. Um, Donald Mackay, as a brain scientist, um, used this technique in criticizing purely materialistic interpretations of human nature, maintaining that uh, physical state language omits the I language, the I states of mental state language. I remember talking with him one time. We were both of us speaking at conferences, two different conferences which happened to meet in the same facility. And so we gravitated to each other at um, dinner time for three nights running and had a three um, stages philosophical dialogue accordingly, largely about this issue. And I was trying, I'd sat in on one of his presentations and was trying to suggest to him that uh, all he was doing was saying that um, uh, we can understand human nature if we use physical state, brain state language, and mental state language, but that's not saying anything about the nature of mind. That's just using empirical language, empirical data language. You're not doing anything to the mind-body problem. You're not saying anything about the existence of mind. To which he responded, eventually after we had worked through this, that, and the other, well, how would I say it? What would I have to go on? All I've got is what the Bible says and empirical data. And the Bible doesn't say anything explicitly about the existence of a metaphysical entity called mind or soul. I said, well, what about a metaphysical assertion? some metaphysical um, conceptualization. And he leaned back and said, metaphysical? And then the penny dropped. You mean you're operating with the empirical verifiability criterion? Yeah. He was a positivist. You know um, he, he wanted, as an empirical scientist, to stick with either empirical data or biblical data. Get it? And he was therefore stuck about handling metaphysical questions that are involved in certain Christian beliefs. Okay. He um, um, was a remarkable individual, and I think one of the real losses was that he died of cancer um, just a couple of years ago, um, a man who was still publishing and doing some first-rate work, Donald Mackay. You may have seen his book, The Clockwork Universe, things of that sort. All right. Um, now, where does he get this conception of analysis working for logical equivalency? Look at page 70, his concluding remark. Incidentally, look at the footnote on page 70, footnote 1. There's ground for saying the philosopher is always concerned with an artificial language. That's the ideal language tradition. But um, the thing I want is the last lines there. It's to be remarked that the process of analyzing a language is facilitated if it's possible to use for the classification of its forms an artificial system of symbols whose structure is known. The best known example is the so-called system of logistics, symbolic logic, employed by Russell and Whitehead in Principia Mathematica. Uh, so you get a much more precise logical analysis of equivalences if you translate it into symbolic logic. Okay. <coughs> Well, any questions there? Okay, chapter four. Uh, chapter four, the a priori, and here take a look at page 75. 
page 75, where you notice um, the name of Mill is spattered over these pages, 74 and 75, because he's rejecting Mill's theory of the a priori which, as he points out at the top of 75, is that the propositions of logic and metaphysics, take it back, logic and mathematics, have the same status as empirical hypotheses. Remember, Mill denied that there was any a priori at all, the laws of logic are empirical generalizations as are mathematical propositions. Okay. Um, now, to that, um, he says, Ayer says, we maintain that they are independent of experience in the sense that they don't own their validity to empirical verification. We may come to discover them through an inductive process, but once we've apprehended them, we see that they are necessarily true. The best way to substantiate this, halfway down the page, the new paragraph, that the truths of logic and math are necessarily true is to examine cases. And he goes on to do so. And uh, the point that he is making is that these truths are necessary because, page 77, first paragraph, um, about six lines in, the principles of logic and mathematics are true universally simply because we never allow them to be anything else. And the reason for this is that we cannot abandon them without contradicting ourselves. That's the old definition of a necessary truth, one whose contradictory is self-contradictory. We cannot abandon them without contradicting ourselves, <coughs> without sinning against the rules that govern the use of language, making our utterances self-stultifying. In other words, the truths of logic and mathematics are analytic propositions or tautologies. And as tautologies, they're not true of anything. They're just useful tautologies that we employ every time we use language and um, uh, try to use words univocally rather than equivocally. So uh, at the bottom of 78, he makes the point that if a proposition is analytic, when its validity depends solely on the definition of the symbols it contains, definitions, you see, and synthetic when its validity is determined by the facts of experience. So um, philosophy is concerned with definitions and what follows by definitions, follows from definitions. That is to say, from um, logic. And as a result, philosophy on page um, 80 and 81 is treated as simply an application of logic. An application of logic to language. The application of logic to language. Now, um, I think it's fair to say that those first four chapters um, are really concerned with the machinery, the mechanisms of logical positivism and what in terms of its methodology is distinctive. Chapters, and, and obviously that's the tremendously important thing to get a hold of. Chapters five and six begin to get into more substantive issues. Chapter 5, talking of truth and probability, one main thing I want to stress here, it is that the question, what is truth? The problem of truth is really simply a problem of definition. A problem of definition in use. But when I say of a proposition that it's true, what do I mean? 
What's the logical equivalence? And you'll find that um, his argument is very simple, that when I say uh, P is true, all I'm doing is asserting P. Um, it is true that the course is nearly ended. What does it is true that add? Doesn't add anything. So the assertion of truth is not itself a cognitive statement. I'm not asserting something in addition to a sentence. It is rather what gets to be called a performative utterance. A performative utterance is one that performs another function. You'll see. When the minister says at the end of the marriage ceremony, I now pronounce you man and wife, he's not informing you about something. What he's doing is performing a religious and civil function. And so it's a performative utterance between um, two philosophers, P.F. Strawson and J.L. Austin, became known as the Strawson-Austin debate, in which Strawson took, took essentially Ayer's view that all truth assertions are performatives. And Austin said, no, you cannot translate <laughs> The statement, it is true that, without loss, into simply a performative utterance. Or put it another way, the statement, it is true that the course is nearly ended, is not the logical equivalent of the translation, the course is nearly ended. You see. The thing that is left out in the translation is the assertion that there is some extra-linguistic state of affairs to which the statement, the course has nearly ended, is referring. Yes, it's a way of referring to an extra-linguistic, something beyond the language, an actual state of affairs. Austin is, in other words, asserting a correspondence definition of truth. Okay. So A. I got himself into hot water a bit over that one. Well, he goes on to point out that um, in matters of verification and falsification, all that's available is probability anyway. But it's chapter 6, which is really the crux that um, you want to pay particular attention to. The critique of ethics and theology. All right, you know his procedure. What he's going to be doing is talking about the logical equivalent of ethical judgments. The logical equivalent of ethical judgments. And for that matter, aesthetic judgments as well. And in order to get at that, he distinguishes four kinds of ethical utterances. Look on page 103 and note carefully the four kinds. 
first. This is uh, six lines into the first complete paragraph on 103. First, definitions of ethical terms. Okay. Right means what is just. Things of that sort. Now, you know what he thinks about definitions of ethical terms? That they're analytic. They're not true or false. They're simply a statement of how we're using language. Conventions. Second, propositions describing the phenomena of moral experience. I feel terrible about that. Well, that's in psychologically interesting, isn't it? You see, such a um, uh, description of the phenomena of moral experience are psychological descriptions, or perhaps social descriptions. Society, this society, frowns on. You see? So there you've got psychological and sociological statements. Third, exhortations to moral virtue. Chin up, old chap. Britishism, after all. But an exhortation to moral virtue is not a statement, true or false. It's an exhortation, an encouragement, has a different function. Fourth, there are actual ethical judgments. Okay. Actual ethical judgments. Voting so-and-so in again would be morally irresponsible. Such and such is unjust. Moral judgments. Now, what is their logical equivalent? Now, in the case of definitions, it's fine. These are tautologies, conventional tautologies. Phenomena of moral experience, all right, the sociologist um, can see if it's a true description of social attitudes. Um, exhortations to moral virtue, well, there are various ways of doing that. Uh, just a squeeze in the arm might do it just as well. Um, but ethical judgments, you'll see. Now, um, remember, if I say that um, such and such X is right or good, you see, and um, right and good have to be defined, well, what sort of definitions? Well, let's see. Um, supposing you have a utilitarian definition, and he discusses that in the chapter. But um, th what this translates is then X I is productive of Y consequences. That's a sociological statement, not a moral statement. The utilitarian defines a moral term in non-moral ways. It reduces the moral to the non-moral, to sociological, psychological uh, things that can be observed. And so utilitarianism does not uh, make sense of moral judgments. He agrees with um, G.E. Moore in rejecting the naturalistic fallacy, defining the good in terms of any natural kind of property. But inasmuch as uh, any other definition, deontological, is a matter of convention, 
to say X is right is saying no more than um, something like that. You'll see. Uh, in other words, um, it is simply an emotivism, an expression of emotion, an expression of feeling. Distinguish emotivism from subjectivism. He does. The subjectivist ethic, like that of David Hume, defines the good and the right in terms of certain subjective feelings which people have. Really what the subjectivist is doing is translating moral statements into psychological statements. But the emotivist is not translating moral statements into a statement at all, because there are no moral statements to translate into, into psychological statements. He's saying that a moral judgment like X is right, X is good, is not a judgment. There's no meaningful predicate, no factually meaningful predicate. And consequently, all you have is an emotive expression, an exclamation, exclamation. You see, an outburst. It's like saying, don't. You see, but the don't gets to be more the hortatory thing. So, um, in, uh, in this uh, development of emotivism, what he's doing is rejecting any empirical translation, utilitarian, subjectivist sort. He's rejecting any um, intrinsic, intuitive conception of right, like Kant seemed to assert. You think? He's saying there are no such things as moral judgments. There is moral language, but um, moral judgments are no more than emotive outbursts. Well, that was uh, picked up by uh, C.L. Stevenson, who taught at Michigan. In his book, Ethics and Language, and Stevenson added one more thing, while um, ethical language is indeed um, emotive outburst, um, it also has a rhetorical effect. By telling you that something is right or wrong, I'm um, engaged in some rhetorical act of persuasion. You'll see. Um, and um, insofar as we have moral arguments, we're not arguing about right or wrong. We're just arguing about the facts of the case. And then we use the rhetoric, the emotive rhetoric, on top of the facts of the case. It's interesting to see the way in which certain uh, public presentations do that. Um, do you remember the Francis Schaeffer film about abortion that showed all of the dolls lying around over the landscape? And that's wrong. Notice there was no moral argument. What there was was the bare facts that can be seen and the emotional rhetoric of the language. I suspect they didn't realize what they were doing. They were playing the positivist game, <laughs> an emotivist ethic, rather than, yeah. Too easy to do that. And I think you'll notice that in um, election year, you'll find a lot more of it. Okay. All right, we didn't get to the religion part. I'll pick up on that and use it as the springboard to move on and talk about philosophy of religion um, since positivism.